title of my sermon this morning is The Bond of Christian Marriage, Part 4, and the subtitle is Reasons to Remain as You Are. So wives put up a lot from, with, with a lot from their husbands, and I'm sure this is true of my wife. She, I think I got a little snappy with her this morning when the printer wasn't working. I mean, I was mad at that printer. So I got frustrated with my wife. And as a pastor's wife, there's it's, it's even more to it, in case you guys didn't realize this. And for me, it is a calling, and, and, it's a, and a lot is asked out of my family. Uh, random late night phone calls, being at church earlier than everyone else, for the most part. And uh, where are we at? Uh, filling in for absent children's Bible study teachers, etc. My wife does it all, as many uh, other wives do as well. Anne LePage is the wife of Maine Governor Paul LePage. Now, you might be thinking, how am I tying a governor's wife into the amazing woman that is my wife? Well, you see, Anne LePage is the wife of the lowest paid governor in the entire country. To supplement her husband's $70,000 a year income to govern the state of Maine, Anne decided to go get a job at a place called McSeagull's. It's not a McDonald's offshoot, it's McSeagull's. It's a seafood restaurant in Booth's Bay, Harbor, Maine. Uh, and she got the job after her daughter had worked there the previous year, and, and, and the daughter was making $28 an hour waiting tables. So, I mean, so she decided to, to go supplement her income. See, the LePages live with their dog, a Jack Russell Terrier named Vito, which if you know, get the government thing, it makes a lot of sense, in, 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 uh, in the Augusta Governor's Mansion, and they also bought a house and, uh, in just two years previous. Uh, the governor, um, Paul LePage, attempted to raise the, uh, his successor's income to $150,000 a year, which is... Uh, near above the nearly 135 million, or 135 million, 135,000 average for all 50 governors in the two, in 2015. So they really don't get paid very much, to tell you the truth, which is kind of surprising. Uh, I mean, you would just think a governor would make more money um, than, than that, but that's that's what they're making, you know. So I guess being a government official isn't necessarily the best uh, best job. Like I've said over the past several weeks, marriage has its ups and downs. Frequently things happen in marriage that bring stress into a marriage. Just like all of life's frustrations and the afflictions that we face, the only way to overcome them is through Jesus. This morning we're going to continue our study through the first, um, uh, first book to the Corinthian church in the seventh chapter in Paul's teaching on marriage. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for the chance you've given us to worship you and to study your word. Bless me as I do my best to declare it accurately and in a way that makes sense to each and every one of us. Allow us to all partake in your word today. In your wonderful name, amen. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And like I've said, for the past several weeks, we've been cruising through the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians and looking about what Paul has to say about marriage. Last week, I talked about remaining in your current situation which I more or less told you meant whatever, um, whatever situation you're in, that you need to be content in that situation. This week, Paul's going to give us three reasons why the Corinthian Christians should remain in their marital situation. Marital situation, I'm emphasizing. Last week, I applied it in a, on a broader, um, broader spectrum, spectrum, but I really don't feel that, for some reason, just the text today, it could be applied on a broader spectrum as a remain in your situation because of circumstances, and he's going to give us the reasons. But I think it makes more sense from a marital perspective. That's just what I'm getting at. I think it has more of an, of an application um, from your marital perspective, whatever that may be, either single, widowed, divorced, married, or whatever that may be, whatever your circumstances, that's, I think that's what we're looking at today. Now, it's also important to remember, kind of a disclaimer, the, I'm going to give you three reasons that I'm taking right from the text. These three reasons may not apply to you. I mean, there, there are three things that most definitely apply to the Corinthian Christians, but they don't necessarily apply to us as a group, as in humanity, or us as individuals. They might not particularly apply to you. But like I said, they did have a great application for the Corinthian Christians, which is why Paul wrote them. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25 to 35, the Apostle Paul gives us three reasons someone should remain in the marital situation they are in. So, number one... Coming persecution. Coming persecution. Remain as you are in view of the present distress, meaning persecution. Look at verse 25 to 28. Paul writes, Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord. 
But I gave an opinion as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. I think then that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek to be a, um, do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. So Paul, interesting words. And again, you need to get the context here. You know, virgins, first of all, comes from the Greek word parthenos. And it means a, a, marital, a marriageable aged maiden, you know, a woman who is of marital age, a woman who has never had sexual intercourse with a man. And in reality, it's just any individual who has not had sex with another person, a virgin, a young virgin, a mar like someone at a younger age than, than you know, someone who, who is, of course, not at that age. Paul's response, it seems very, okay, let me, I'm trying to read my, my iPad here. Uh, Paul's response, it seems clear, in Paul's response, it seems clear that the Corinthian Christians had questions regarding this. Exactly what the questions were, we don't really know. I mean, what were the questions? What, what precisely were, were they trying to figure out? Nonetheless, this is what Paul gave them. This is the, his answer to their questions. And it's also important to remember, and this is kind of interesting, and I actually heard someone, uh, when I listened to someone preach, not Spurgeon, someone else, this week on this text, um, in the first, uh, verse 25, again, he's saying, I have no command from the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. Paul did not get direct revelation from God about this, this particular piece of information. With that in mind, Paul is an ordained apostle of the Lord. You know, this is the apostle Paul. Guess what? Just because he didn't get it from God doesn't mean it isn't, doesn't have authority. With that in mind, we shouldn't make doctrine off of this. Like, this shouldn't be so important that we are going to base an entire uh, a belief system off of it. And to some level, this is where a lot of, like, Roman Catholicism, the idea of a celibate priest, like, their idea was that there was no way for a minister to truly preach the Word of God and to minister to other people if they were also married. And you're going to hear that in a moment as well. And Paul makes some very good points. But what Paul's saying, it is, it is not, how do you say it, this isn't, Directly from God, this is Paul giving advice, is what, what it's saying here. So, look at verse 26 now. In verse 26, Paul tells the Corinthians that he feels it is good for them to remain as they are. Paul's rationale for this is, is the present distress, the persecution that was coming, which it very clearly is referencing to persecution. It could also have an application of just any frustrations we might have, difficulties that we might have. Um, trials and temptations and, and afflictions that arise in our lives. In verses 27 and 28, uh, Paul gives us examples which all relate once again to marriage. Paul says, stay where you're at because persecution is coming. If you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. And then Paul also emphasizes that it doesn't, this doesn't mean, just because he's saying this doesn't mean that if you get married, it's a sin. Again, he's emphasizing that. It's very important. And then Paul ends verse 28 by saying, Yet such will have trouble, meaning those who marry in the midst of persecution will have trouble in this life. And I am trying to spare you. There is nothing wrong with marrying in the midst of a time of persecution. But the bottom line is you're going to have trouble during that time. Paul's trying to spare you from that trouble. And it, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Imagine if we were in the, in the midst of an immense type of persecution, a trial, something going on that's intense, like a, even a famine. Guess what? If I was living by myself, it would be a whole lot easier to feed myself. But now I have to feed my entire family. That's what Paul's saying. Very practical, very to the point. That's what he's saying. If you know that imminent persecution is coming, and they did, they, they, I mean, understand that they were facing persecution, and only a few years later, a Roman Emperor Nero is going to go crazy on them. I mean, he's going to go nuts talking about serious persecution. This could have very well been something of a prophecy by Paul saying, Hey, you know, I know you want to get married, and that's great, but you're going to face some serious trials coming up. Do you want to have to deal with that with the spouse? I mean, that, that's just what he's saying. Again, very practical. I mean, because the other rationale is, do you want to face that without the person you love? And then that's kind of what Paul's getting at, too. You know, it's not a sin to get, you know, to get married. Just remember, there's baggage that comes along with that. 
There's stuff you have to deal with now. As the husband, you are now responsible for more than just yourself in the midst of immense persecution. I mean, like I said, Nero goes crazy from the year 64 to 68 AD. He goes real insane on the Christians. And a lot of the persecution we hear about, it came from this period of persecution within the early church. Now, there are places in our world today where Christians are facing real persecution, very real persecution, where their lives are literally at risk. But, of course, this is also nothing new. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 to 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I mean, persecution is very real today. People can relate to this today. And we, we like to say, oh, we're being persecuted. We're facing persecution. We're not facing persecution. Not the way that the biblical figures, not the way that the city of Corinth faced. And by no means the way the people overseas right now are facing persecution. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Despite the persecutions that people face throughout our world today, we have a Savior of peace who's there to, to comfort us. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's also saying that even if maybe we're not being persecuted the way, we, the way that some people in our world are today, there's a very good chance that we will face this persecution one day. It will be at our doorstep one day, and we need to be prepared for it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Persecution is a very real thing in our world today. I mean, we see it on the news. We see people being um, beheaded for their beliefs. A lot of the refugees that have entered our country are here because of Christian persecution. They are Christian people that have fled their homelands. Can you imagine being forced to a country that is so foreign to you, and sadly, a country that's really rejecting um, so many people? Like, that's not really welcoming of you, all because of, uh, of immense persecution that you're facing in your homeland. While we might not be directly affected by it this year, we might not be affected by it today, it is very real, and it is very likely that one day in our future we could be seeing it uh, right in front of us. In this scenario, though, what Paul is getting at is that it might be better to remain as you are. I mean, it might not be a smart idea to enter into a relationship. That's what Paul's getting at. Number two, the second reason why we should remain as we are in our marital situation is Christ's approaching return. His approaching return. Remain as you are. The time has been shortened. Look at verse 29 to 30 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they have none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who reject as though they did not rejo or those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. The time has been shortened is a clear reference to the second coming of Jesus. And of course, again, like this was written almost 2,000 years ago. So this is not a new thing. I mean, 2,000 years ago, they were waiting for Jesus to return. And guess what? We're still waiting for him to return. With that in mind, Jesus is coming. And the Bible says he can come at any time, any, any moment. Jesus could return. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. Do this, knowing the time. That it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Not in strife and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh 
in regard to its lusts. Paul is saying that since Christ's return is, is soon, it could be at any moment, marriage might not be the best idea. Once again, I mean, and this is kind of a different perspective. If we knew the end was coming, and, and of course we don't know when the end's there, so this is really a difficult um, point to make. But if the end was for soon, you know, I mean, if we know it's like a couple weeks from now, there's no real point of getting married, is really, is really what he's getting at. What's the point of getting married if our remaining time on earth is short? Paul is telling us not to get attached to the temporal things of this world and focus on the eternal things to come. And that's really what his point is here. Again, this is not saying that the end is near, nor is it saying that we shouldn't get married. What this is saying is we need to focus on God. We need to focus on what is eternal, not temporal, not temporary. Jesus tells us, John chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. All the physical elements of this life are temporary. They're going to just disappear one day. We're going to lose them. Nothing. You can't take anything with you. You, know, you can't hook up a U-Haul trailer to your hearse. It just doesn't work that way. No matter how hard you try. The only thing on this earth that is eternal is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 25. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your salvation is eternal. It's something that you can take into the next life. And it's something that you need to take into the next life. Don't take risks with your eternal security. You might think that you have plenty of time to make this decision to accept Christ. To make a decision to continue to walk with Christ. But guess what? The end can come at any time. We don't know when it's going to happen. It can happen today. It can happen tomorrow. It can happen 2,000 years from now. We don't know. The point is we need to be prepared. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The end could be at any moment. It could be, it could be for, like I said, it could be a thousand years from now, it could be two thousand years from now, but it also could be tomorrow. And really the point that I think Paul is getting at, and at least the point I want to emphasize, is that if, if it was today, are you ready? And I, I hope you sure are. Number three. Is the third reason why we should remain in our marital situation is to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. To secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. And this is very true of someone who is single. This would be the main reason to remain single. But I think this is also true of a, of a, of a, a person who is married. I mean, we are beneficial in the situation that we are married. We are in a, an established relationship. You could focus on God. You've developed that. Newlyweds might not be focusing as much on God. And I'm going to hit at that in a moment. Look at verse 32 to 35. Paul writes, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to, to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. To secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. I mean, that really should be our goal. For every one of us, and I'm going to tell you that in a moment. But looking at verse 32, Paul's goal for the Corinthian Christians is for them to live a life free of concern. The Greek word used here for free of concern literally means free from anxiety or free from care. 
I mean, every one of us has anxieties in this life. We get worked up about many different things. We need to be free from those. And the only way we're free from those is with a relationship with Jesus. Paul believes that in a time of trial, a hardship, being single might be better. And again, think about that. And try to understand what he is saying. A time of true, uh, you know, in a time of true life-threatening persecution, having to worry about a spouse can make, uh, can make fighting through that persecution a much more difficult thing. It's really, it's really the point here. And then Paul continues by saying someone who is not married is able to truly um, dedicate themselves, oh, come on, truly able to dedicate him, his or herself um, to the Lord, their life to the Lord, with, while someone who is married has his or her, um, their, their time is divided between their spouse and the Lord. And we know that, most definitely. I mean, I am dividing my time up amongst multiple different things. The pie chart of our life is divided up but into multiple different areas. Someone who is single has less distractions than someone who is married. I mean, that's just really, that's the point he's getting, very much to the point. Then in verse 35, Paul gives an explanation as to why he's telling the church this. This is why he's telling the church this. In verse 35, Paul is telling the Corinthians that, that this, especially those who are unmarried, not to restrain them, but for their benefit. He's telling this to, this to benefit them. He's not trying to put restraints on them. He wants them to understand that this could be a better situation for them. He says to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Someone who is single, meaning not in any relationship, not just married, but not even um, courting someone, if you want to use that word. This individual is able to dedicate themselves to the Lord exclusively. And again, think about all that goes into a romantic relationship. I think about my wife and I. And when I met Tabitha, I was working on my bachelor's degree. And let's just say, I, don't, I think I had some struggles finishing it right during that time. Because now your, your time is devoted to the relationship. So again, the romantic relationship specifically. Right after we got married, and really right after we met, to some level, she went off to boot camp. So I'm sending her letters and stuff. But right after we got married, she, was, she went to Japan. And now I'm in, in New Mexico on my own. And, and let's just say our cell phone bills got a little bit high when we, you know, I started calling her. Or I forgot how we did. We call, I called her phone directly. And let's just say long distance to Japan, even in what, 10 years ago, is still kind of expensive. I mean, that's what you do. And that's the distractions that we have. I'm also pretty sure that I got in trouble once or twice at work for talking to her maybe more frequently than I needed to be. But that's another story. Uh, someone not in a relationship is able to dedicate themselves towards other things. And in this situation, specifically towards God. With this in mind, it is still important for all of us to make sure that we are devoted to God in an undistracted relationship with Him. The New Living Translation translates this end of this verse, verse uh, 35. It says it this way. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with, a few with as few distractions as possible. I mean, that, that's Paul's goal. I think what Paul is talking about here and in the end of verse 35 is a daily walk with Jesus, a daily walk with Christ. Paul tells us to, that we are, or he tells us that our daily walk with Christ is appropriate. And of course, that, that's uh, in opposition to a life that's inappropriate, meaning a life walking in sin. So a life with Christ is appropriate, a life without Christ is not. He wants us to live a, a life free of distractions. Paul tells us that a walk with Jesus needs to be one absent of distractions. And we know that there are distractions. There's a lot of things that could distract us. So a lot of times we have to fight towards this. Fight towards the, the, the living a life of uh, free of distractions by removing those distractions from our lives. If your phone is a distraction, put your phone away. If, if you're, you know, the, if even your job, maybe your job takes up too much of your time. And that's really real, that's a reality too. Make the appropriate changes, whatever they may be. Do what you need to do to make sure you are living a life of undistracted devotion to the Lord. Finally, what Paul is saying is that a daily walk with God is one full of devotion to Him. A devotion to Him. Now the Greek word for devotion literally means sitting constantly by. Sitting constantly by. In Luke chapter 10, we hear a story about Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42 now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. So Jesus is teaching, Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, Martha's cleaning the house and preparing dinner. 
But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to, Mary, said to Martha, he said to her, Martha, 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 you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary was dedicated to the Lord. She was sitting in devotion to Jesus by his feet, sitting constantly by. Jesus and his disciples were also devoted to him. But of course, we also know that this devotion uh, fled right, quite quickly when the time got hot, when things got heated. My, uh, Matthew chapter 26, 31 to 35, Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. I, always, I find that interesting because when Peter gets the bad rap, he's the one who denied him. But all the disciples said it, and of the eleven remaining disciples, only John was at the foot of the cross. You know, those other, with, other than Peter, the other nine disciples fled. They ran off once times got heated. I mean, and even John, John I can't be given any credit to. He fled too. He didn't stay there. He didn't die with Jesus. He, he chose his own life over the life of Christ. As Christians, we need to devote ourselves solely to the Lord. So let me go ahead and close up. And I'm going to close up with a couple of questions. First of all, how devoted are you to Jesus? How devoted are you to Jesus? Are you devoted to the level that the disciples were, are? Who, once things got real, ran the other way? Are you devoted enough to give your own life for Him? Remember, He has already given His life for you. What does devotion to Christ look like? And th this is really a great question, because we say, I say, you know, are you devoted to the Lord, but what does it look like? And of course, Jesus tells us. Matthew 16, verse 24, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. Jesus is calling for sacrifice. He's calling for us to make changes in our lives. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to give part of our life up. And what He's saying here with the, the whole take up, the, take up His cross, He's saying that He wants us to be willing to die for Him. It's not saying that we will. A lot of Christian people haven't. But we need to be willing to do so. We need to deny ourselves. We need to follow Him. We need to make changes in our lives that will, that will involve this. This is a relationship that is 24-7, seven, seven days a week, all year long. This is not one that comes and goes. This is not one that starts Sunday morning at, what, 9 a.m. And ends at, you know, at whatever time. Well, it's almost noon now, right? The relationship doesn't end when you leave church. You know, it isn't only when you're in church. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. You need to dedicate yourself to the Lord. What does this mean? It means talking to Him through prayer. Getting to know Him through His Word and fellowshipping with Him through His church. Do you talk to Jesus every day? Do you pray to Him on a regular basis? Do you have a good knowledge of Jesus through His Word? I'm telling you right now, when I got married and when I met Tabitha, her aunt or her family gave me a book that told me everything about her. My marriage would be even stronger than it is today, right? My relationship with Jesus is not going to be strong if I don't read the book that tells me everything about Him. This is how we know Jesus. Do you hear, read, study, meditate on and memorize the Word of God? And do you spend enough time with His church and your fellow Christians, the fellowship of the saints? Now is your time to dedicate your life to Jesus and to devote your whole being to a daily walk with Him. We need to devote ourselves to the Lord 100%. Remember, the time is short. At any moment, the end could come. The only question I have left for you is, are you ready? Let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for all that you've done. I ask that you bless us now as we focus on you and as we think about this, uh, this next week. 
Allow us to remain in you. We talk about remaining in our marital situations, Lord, but most importantly, we need to remain in you. We need to stay in a relationship with you. We need to grow in our relationship with you. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. I ask that you bless us now as we prepare to depart, Lord. Allow us to remember all that you've taught us so that we can teach it to others, so that we can go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Lord, I praise you now. I thank you and I ask once again that you give us insight, Lord. You allow your spirit to work through us as we depart. Allow your spirit to continue to work within us and allow your spirit to just cause us to grow in our relationship with you. Allow us to know that no matter what the circumstances are, you are there for us and that you are completely in control. In your wonderful name, amen.